welcome um, to this webinar today where we want to focus on changing health and safety culture in organizations. My name is Helena Zajic-Derzik and I'm the Implementation Manager at EcoPodal. For those of you who haven't heard much about us, EcoPodal is a health and safety risk management software which can be configured specifically to organizations' needs, including their particular terminology, processes, workflows, organization structures, and so on. <clears throat> I've been with EcoPodal from the start and have implemented our risk management software in organizations across many industries over the last eight years. And during that time, I've come across quite a few typical patterns that can either lead to a really successful uptake of organizational change, but I've also noticed a few warning signs which can lead to issues further down the path when it comes to engaging the organization to embrace the changes and make the most out of health and safety improvements. But before we get into the details, just some tiny housekeeping things. I hope you can all hear me all right and also see my screen. I'm currently sharing the, sharing the first slide of the webinar, which you should be able to see. We've muted the audience, so I cannot hear you, but um, you're very much encouraged to ask questions, provide feedback, or, or your own stories or experiences, of course. So to do that, there is a chat function in the software, and you can find that on the bottom right side of the screen. Just click in the text field and type in your thoughts, and we can then um, share that and discuss it at the end. The other participants will also see what you're typing in there. <clears throat> All right, let's get into it. Why health and safety culture? Well, in New Zealand, it's now been over two years that the health and safety legislation changed. And it's very obvious that many organizations spread across all sorts of different industries make a tremendous effort to improve health and safety for their internal people, as well as external people, such as contractors. So they change practices, policies, procedures, SOPs, they implement management systems to support the new practices, they create better records, more visibility and tra transparency to everyone, and most of all, um, health and safety concerns are on top of most agendas, not only high-level management meetings, but also smaller meetings like toolbox, mix, toolbox meetings, weekly meetings, and so on. What we also notice is that although health and safety teams have been established, people are very, and people in those teams are really not, a, not a, knowledgeable about what needs to be done, updated and implemented, it can often be a really big challenge to take the rest of the organization suc successfully onto that journey. So we can see that organizations of all sizes struggle to increase uptake of changing health and safety practices. And simply because it's, that's simply because it's not always part of their day-to-day -day <clears throat> jobs or their job descriptions. So today what we really want to do is focus on how to change health and safety culture and provide you with some tips and examples and experiences we've made when implementing health and safety software in organizations. And what we do together with our clients to develop momentum and create significant uptake of health and safety practices. With me, I've got Chris O'Fleur today. Chris is the health and safety and environmental manager at Duke in New Zealand. And he's been with Duke since December, 2016. <clears throat> Prior to his role there, he had a role as health safety and security manager at ACC from 2010, and from 2005 to 2010, he was a security manager at ACC. Chris has extensive experience in managing teams to change management processes. At ACC, he was responsible for 3,300 staff across 33 branches, from Invercargo to Fundarai, so the entire New Zealand, and that included service centers and corporate office. Before his career at ACC, he worked um, for over 14 years at the police. And before that, he spent um, his career in the building industry in Christchurch and also in Australia. So Chris is definitely a man with lots of experiences in different areas and someone who's been part of many challenging change management processes, some of which are directly related to health and safety, but also other business changes. So I can definitely assure you, hearing from him on how Duke can implement changes to health and safety internally across a number of sites, and also how, how they include their contractors, will be very insightful. Cool. Um, <clears throat> we all know that doing things differently is often hard. So as people need to be, so people need to be convinced that new approaches are the right approach, or even better than the previous way of doing things. It's especially hard to take up changes for people who haven't been part in that decision to change things. 
So, but obviously in a globalized and ever-changing world, there are always going to be changes and shifts, and it's very topical at the moment um, to change things around health and safety, and that influences the culture of an organization. Today, we want to explicitly talk about those changes and how you can get all or hopefully most of your staff on board and take them along on that journey. We want to share different approaches that might suit different types of organizations, and hopefully you go away from this webinar finding some of these um, useful for you and um, maybe some of them also that you can implement right away. Also, I want you to go away from this session having learned about why it is still important to make changes and how to take your staff with you. Our examples relate to implementing health and safety software in organizations, but it is obviously also um, applicable to businesses um, that want to strengthen their health and safety culture, their actions, and not just focus on software implementation. So there are different parts of an implementation process, be it through software or any other form um, of health and safety changes. And that's obviously the start of the implementation where you want to engage people, obviously the top level management, the right project group, but also setting the right expectations amongst the entire organization. Then there's a time during the implementation where you want to inform staff about the changes. Um, and then there is a launch in the pilot phase. So we will focus on these different phases, as you can see on that slide, and come um, and we'll provide you with some different examples of what you could do there to actively and also passively in include your team members. So the next slide here is the start of the implementation. At the start of the implementation, basically, when we hand over from sales team to implementation team, um, we usually have a kickoff meeting. And in that session, we make sure that both the client or the user um, of the health and safety management system, as well as the software provider, in that case, it would be Access Eco Portal, set the expectations right and discuss the required outcomes of the project. We find that this is key to effective setup of health and safety management systems to ensure that we can deliver what the client is asking for and um, also keep that in mind during the entire implementation process. This then obviously enables the client to have peace of mind to know that we are all on the same page and that they can support their project group to deliver internally agreed outcomes for top level management, but also to other internal and external stakeholders. So often health and safety management system also needs to be very useful for external stakeholders like the contractors, um, but obviously also internal stakeholders like every single staff member. What's really important at the start of the implementation is choosing the right project group. So depending on the type of organization, the structure, the industry and the key influences um, and so on, this project group can include people from different departments or from different branches. We find it quite important to ensure that one person in the project group can make final decisions and communicate them in an effective way to the software provider or whoever the party is that helps them setting up the health and safety management system. That feedback loop and active communication is really key for a successful setup of the health and safety software or management system. To ensure that, there are regular catch-ups that are really crucial. Of course, in a globalized world, um, in a globalized world, um, it doesn't always have to be a face-to-face -face meeting, but phone catch-ups can do the job, video conferences, screen sharing, emails, are all beneficial ways of doing that. We also recommend using a collaboration tool where other party can share feedback at any time, and it can be discussed between the health and safety <coughs> management provider and the project group. So these regular meetings sound like a very, um, common way of doing things. Not all clients implement those. And this is why I thought it was worthwhile mentioning here because they really help to avoid miscommunication. And if there are misunderstandings, they're usually being picked up very quickly and then rectified. From our experience, we recommend at least weekly meetings at the, at the start, but those can be um, spread out over longer time periods later on. So at the same time, a project group that is too big, um, that involves too many people from too many branches or departments, um, can lead to problems where people internally in the group can't agree. But also at the same time, we want to make sure that the project group isn't too small because we want to ensure that critical stakeholders are involved from the start. If people aren't involved from the start, you probably have examples from your own life on that. 
and they will be hesitant to take up the changes later on because they feel like their feedback wasn't included and this could just be a personal issue but it could also be that critical things that their experience or that their day-to-day -day job tells them is then not included in the in the health and safety management system and that frustrates them and that way obviously they aren't keen on taking things up so really choosing the right project group is very very critical at the start during the implementation so the project group is obviously involved in the health and safety management system from the very beginning and this exposure means that they're quite familiar with what's going on and they have a lot of intrinsic knowledge already before other people even hear about it. Um, so they have a lot of knowledge that other people don't have. And we all know, um, as I just said, if you aren't involved in something, then you might be very hesitant later on to pick it up. So it is really, really important to include people from the start and pick the right stakeholders and um, to design a very um, effective health and safety management system. And this can be done through very, um, low cost examples as well. So one way of including people and they don't have to be part of the day-to-day -day management group or project group um, are management meetings. So if man middle management or top management, for example, are included on a regular basis on what's going on with the health and safety management system, that can be very critical. We definitely encourage clients to always check in with their top level management and with their middle management to make sure that their opinions are included. So they don't necessarily have to provide feedback on the progress and activities on a day-to-day -day basis, but it is important to get their buy-in um, to ensure that there are enough financial and human resources for the setup of the health and safety management system. Additionally, that helps to ensure that the expectations are considered in the setup. So often board members have particular feedback around what they expect in terms of reporting functionality, in terms of notifications and so on. So a typical setup for them would be that they want to know about everything, they want to be able to have access to everything, but it doesn't mean that they want to be notified um, and get emails on a day-to-day -day basis about every single thing that happens in the organization. Often they want to know about high, high risk scenarios or very um, dramatic incidents, but um, have access to everything anyway. One other example um, of including people is um, from one of our clients, Les Mills. So many of you might have heard of that organization. It's a gym which has numerous locations across New Zealand. In their case, the project team mainly included people from head office, so from one location which is based in Auckland. However, later on, it was um, quite important that people from other sites across the country actively use the health and safety software. So obviously, as I mentioned before, the project team learned really quickly through the implementation process what the different features of the software were and how to use them. However, some of the end users who then later on were expected to manage assets, investigate injuries, review risks and so on, were not involved from day one. So what Les Mills decided to do was to get the MD to create little video messages, which were shared on a regular basis with staff and PTs, with personal trainers. So their personal trainers are often contractors. So in that example, already external stakeholders were involved, but since they're a critical part of the company's success, they were seen as a critical stakeholder who had to be engaged. So those PTs, those personal trainers received those messages as well. These video messages were shared on a regular basis with an update on how the health and safety system setup is going and when people could expect to take a first look at it. That way, users weren't actually that surprised when an email one day was in their inbox, which expected them to log onto the software and actually use it. They were ma made aware of the setup, that the setup was going on. They had a rough idea about when they had to use it and how it affected their work and what their particular role in, <clears throat> in managing or using the software was. Um, by the way, those video messages were actually nothing super fancy or costly, rather they were taken with a very simple camera and might have even been a phone, I think, um, using very normal language, so nothing uh, like a complicated script provided by an external um, organization. You can obviously go with external organizations that help with communication, but I, what I want to show in that example is that it can be done in a very simple way. 
So I'll just play that video for you now. And um, it's super short. We'll have a look at that. Hi, and welcome to your new Health and Safety Hub Eco Portal. Our number one priority is keeping our clubs and workplaces safe, and this new system will absolutely help. The great thing about EcoPortal is that all of us, PTs, GFIs, staff, will be able to notify risks and incidents on the fly and really from any device. As soon as any of us log an incident, our club manager will be notified and this will mean that they have full visibility of everything health and safety related in the club. It's super important that you make the time to get familiar with the system so that when you do need to log an incident, you know where to start. There's some great training tools on there as well. And lastly, a really big thank you for getting on board and playing your part in keeping our workplaces safe for both you and your workmates. Awesome. So you can see that was really simple um, and short and sharp. They shared those things regularly and that way it kept every stakeholder engaged and updated. Another example is... Um, let's get to the next one. Another example is from one of our other clients called McFall Fuels. Um, you might have seen their trucks on the roads if you travel on New Zealand motorways quite a bit. They're working in a very high risk industry, transporting dangerous goods around the country and ensuring that health and safety is taken seriously, not just by people in the office, but by everyone being involved with the company is critical. So they sent out monthly newsletters to their team and they had a section on the progress of the health and safety software implementation in there. And that really supported setting up a health and safety culture for them. So basically, because it was part of everyday scenarios, they're used to their newsletter, they I think get them on a fortnightly basis um, and health and safety was just um, part of it, made, um, made it possible for them really to implement um, health and safety culture very well. Yeah, obviously the newsletter um, has to be written in a fun and engaging way. So obviously if it's, a, it's, if it's something that's rather lame, then people don't pick it up. But they know how their staff react to things. They already have a culture where people read the newsletter and adding health and safety to it um, made it possible to show that um, health and safety is a, is a particularly important area to their business. Um, so McFall already had a marketing team that writes those newsletters. They didn't have to set up that communication channel particularly to support the health and safety culture. And it was an easy way to just add culture, cultural, element to, cultural elements to it. And it's obviously a very cost-effective way as well. Interaction with end users. So another simple way of sharing the development and future changes are meetings. So often manufacturing companies, for example, already have weekly or monthly meetings in place. Often they're called toolbox meetings. Other types of organizations might have got monthly meetings or Monday meetings, things like that. And these are a very good opportunity to also embed health and safety changes and culture into their organizations. Meetings are a bit of a more active way of providing information. The last two examples was the newsletter and the video messages are rather passive ways of communicating with people because they just receive the message and it's not really a way for them to provide feedback unless obviously they contact the person that does the video or the newsletter. However, meetings really allow them to, uh, to talk a bit more. So the interaction with the end user is a bit easier. So in those meetings, you can let them know about health and safety changes and thereby embed health and safety into the culture. And you have the chance to react to their worries. Obviously in meetings, you might hear about problems that they see with these changes and it helps to ensure that those are being addressed very early on. The other way um, that meetings are very helpful is that you learn about their terminology. So obviously you want to make sure that you use terminology that the end user uses later on as well. So on one side, when you, when you change and implement health and safety culture or make it a really topical issue in your organization, you probably introduce new words, new terms that people haven't really used before. And it is important to make sure that everyone understands what's meant by those and how those are prioritized. So meetings are a good way of communicating them on a regular basis and thereby embedding health and safety into the culture. 
So in some cases, it also pays off to not change everything in terms of the terminology, because um, when you start implementing or when you implement health and safety changes, it doesn't mean that you haven't had anything around health and safety in your organization before. You might already have things in place that are working really well. And if you adapt and change your system or move to a software, then um, you can obviously keep those things. That makes the uptake for the user at the end of the day a bit easier because they are familiar with a few things already. There might also be processes in place that are rather confusing or duplicates, and then that's a great opportunity to clear them up and people will actually appreciate it. And that way, um, uptake of health and safety changes and um, implementing culture is a lot easier as well. Another rather fun way of implementing health and safety culture and engaging end users are competitions. So the health and safety management system could have a name. So instead of calling it whatever the software provider is called, you could come up with your very own name. And we have quite a few clients that have done that successfully because it gave the end user the feeling that they are part of it, that they are part of the change and that the system has been obviously set up just for them. So those cultural things really help people to want to engage with it. We have a client and their, their company name is called XLAM and they call their management system XSAFE, for example. TVNZ calls their management system My Safety Reporting, also something that's come from the users. We are working with another organization called Homes and they call it Safe at Homes. Um, and then there is Jukin and I've got Chris here from Jukin, they call it The Shed. Chris, do you briefly want to explain um, how you came up with the name The Shed? Sure, we ran a competition with our staff. We wanted to make sure that we um, got a name for uh, the system that resonated with what our business was and it would be something they could refer to in the third person um, as, as something to go and look at or find. So um, the name that we came up with being The Shed was, um, stands for Safety, Health and Environment Data. And I think um, the key thing is that it resonates with um, The Shed being somewhere where you that you put resources or go and find resources or, or put tools um, like in the forest or in the manufacturing environment and um, you know the, the comment would be have you checked out the shed if you have looked in the shed it might be in the shed um, go and put it in the shed so that, that made sense for our business to have that, that name and the resonance of our staff. Cool thanks Chris yes and I mean we have met a lot of the end users and they they really like the name I mean there's still a chance to obviously change it if there are concerns around it but I think the fact that you involved people and they were actively encouraged to think about it um, was a great way to engage them and then also to like encourage them to want to use the system. And if they use the software system, the, the health and safety management system, then obviously it becomes part of their culture automatically. Um, the next stage we want to talk about is the pilot stage. So the pilot is what we call it the pilot when the project project group believes that the system is set up, you're happy with your health and safety management system, with the changes, with the things that are included and excluded and how you report on the different things. But before it's really launched and live, you want to encourage some other people to provide some more feedback. So the project group, as I said at the start, is a, is a smaller group. It doesn't involve everyone from the organization because having it too big obviously means it's too much feedback at the start. But now is a really good time to ask the, some other users for feedback before it's launched. So there are different user groups that can be involved. And um, deciding who should be the users that are involved really depends on, on you as the client, because you know your organization best. There are different ways of including people. It could, for example, be that the middle, ma middle management gets access to the system and really, we always say, play with the system and tries everything out um, and sees if, if those things, if the reports, if the fields that are being filled in work for what they need in their day-to-day -day job. Quite often, they focus on how things are reported, what graphs can they see, how can they get a quick overview of what's going on in different sites in different departments and so on. It also helps to include team leaders in pilot phases, team leaders or shift leaders or branch managers, for example, because they are probably going to be the champions in their teams or on their sites and um, to then encourage other end users to use the system in a, in a good way. So inviting those people to, 
to play with the system really enhances the culture because you get them you get them on board and they understand why the changes have been made and they feel like their feedback can be included before things are launched and obviously it can be included at that stage still very easily quite often these users have some feedback that the project group can't consider um just because they they are in different roles and haven't been um, aware of those things that need to be reported on as well. Otherwise, to um, do a pilot is doing it by by geographical um, teams. So, for example, you could say you try things out on one site, and because it works well for them, you then ensure that it will work for all other sites. But as I said at the start, deciding who's part of the pilot is really up to you guys. You know the organization, you know who should be included and um, who might not have to provide feedback necessarily because, because they will take it up the way it is um, when it's launched. Another key thing for the pilot stage is also to include people that you believe might be against the changes. So in order to get more and more people on board, you'll obviously have some that are resistant to change or scared of change, but including them at the latest at the pilot stage can really help because you will learn about their worries. You will learn about why they are against it, why they want to um, stick to the ways they have been doing things in the past and why they're so worried about doing it differently. Um, so at that stage, it can really be helpful to understand those worries and then still address them before things are launched. <clears throat> in some organizations, we um, also have every end user being part of the pilot. That can be very helpful just to increase the engagement and um, increase the momentum. Before we launch things, we often do trainings and um, trainings can be very helpful to really increase momentum just before something is launched. And training sessions can be arranged in a very different way and it again depends on the structure of the organization as well as the needs and the resources. So at Ecoport, we often do um, different types of training depending on what the client needs and where the different locations are. But a rather cost effective session or way of doing it is obviously screen sharing sessions. And that could be that um, the EcoPortal team, for example, presents the different workflows to the end user. And we structure those sessions um, based on the different roles of the teams. So we would, for example, do sessions just for staff or for senior leadership or for middle management because all these different roles then need to use the health and safety management system in a different way. And again, training really helps to embed the changes into the culture because if people are trained and confident around things, then they can use the health and safety management system. And that way, health and safety is naturally part of their culture. Trainings can also be undertaken by the project group themselves. So often the project group that has implemented the software together with us would actually tour around the country or visit the different sites and do the trainings themselves. Other options are face to tra face trainings with, for example, just middle management or end users, and that really increases momentum and helps users to get access to the system right after the training. So when they get access to the system right after the training, then everything is still very fresh in their minds and they are actually not so scared or worried about having to use something new. And we experience that having training just before the launch is actually a really, really helpful um, way in terms of increasing uptake and um, taking away the fear of having to use something new and again as I said um, thereby strengthening the health and safety culture of, of the organization. Obviously these things can be supplemented with help documents with screen recordings and so on. Um, Chris from Duken has um, some very insightful examples on how they managed health and safety culture change at Duken over the last few months. Um, and to give you a very brief overview, Duke in New Zealand is a forestry company sp spread across three sites in New Zealand. That's the Wairarapa, Gisborne and Kataya. And altogether, Duke in has about 600 staff ranging from office jobs um, to jobs that are done in the mills and the forest. So I'll pass over to Chris and he'll give you some um, really nice insights from his experience in the last few months. Thanks, Helena. Um, you like you said, we're a... Um... We're a company that's been in New Zealand about 30 years. We're Japanese owned. We've got about 700 staff. Um, the average age of our staff is 52 years. Um, and we're in pretty um, regional towns, pretty much. Um, we knew that we had um, to change our culture um, around incident reporting itself, let alone the health and safety management system. Um, 
we had um, basic issues such as our health and safety management system wasn't networked across all of our sites. So although we had um, health and safety management systems, they weren't um, combined, linked on a wider area network. So uh, there was a lack of visibility across um, similar businesses in different towns. Um, so therefore there was inconsistency around um, what versions, what procedures, and what processes our staff were using. Um, there was no overview from the company perspective on live incident um, incidents occurring or um, how the hazards were being managed on a daily basis. Um, the system we were using was mainly paper based and then uploaded into a, a database system, but it wasn't, um, there was no visibility for all of the um, sites to see what was going on. Um, we had other things where um, investigations, some of them were not being investigated completely or in a timely manner, uh, and some not at all. Um, we spoke to staff um, at length at all the sites before we um, configured uh, the system to work for us to make sure that we got it right for our people and knew what the issues were beforehand. Um, because the whole focus was all about them, making sure that we for them, they're the ones on the floor who are encountering these hazards and incidents. So um, they're the ones that feed us with the information so that we can put in the resolutions and um, manage the risks. So we spent a lot of time talking to them. Um, we found there been a lack of follow-up um, and feedback in some areas about what they've reported. Um, hazard reports have been disappearing. Um, actions weren't completed and they weren't advised. So um, there was no... Um, consistency around accountability um, of managing the risks or risk mitigation. Uh, the challenges we the challenges we had um, were mainly around building trust and engaging our staff like we have, um, like I say, about just under 700 staff who a lot of them have been working for us for between 15 and 30 years, um, um, mainly in their 50s and 60s. A lot of them aren't um, used to using PCs, etc. So introducing a whole new system and a new way of doing things um, is a challenge in itself. And then why we were wanting to do it and what they'd get out of it um, was the considerations. Um, we, we went about being open and honest with them. Um, we talked about creating a, a no, no fault or a no blame work environment. Uh, there was questions from some staff in some of these towns where they've got family members working in other parts of the same um, manufacturing part where they would uh, be seen to be knocking if they reported an incident or a hazard they'd seen nearby rather than um, getting a, a pat on the back for um, making it safer. Um, and so um, they were a challenge as well. Um, we had to show them and promise them that the system would ensure that there was follow up and feedback for them as well so that um, the value of them um, reporting um, would be seen and um, along with the accountability of our leaders right up to the director. Um, so when we were um, planning the launch of the shed, um, we spent a considerable amount of time talking to these frontline staff um, to find out what their issues were and what would work for them and what they expected. And we made sure that once we understood that, we could design um, a delivery specifically that worked for them. Um, we had to talk about the issues that have been in the past, what would work for them going forward, and what they wanted to see. Um, a lot of challenges included things such as English being a second language, um, literacy issues, um, having access to a computer in the workplace. A lot of these people, women and men work on machines. Um, they might use a, um, a mainframe PC for printing labels or counting stock, but they would never have access to anything else. So they didn't have a lot of experience around using computers. Um, some of them were never used. Um, a keyboard in their lives. Um, they had never had email accounts um, and they hadn't logged on to a PC at all within JNL. So as part of uh, our requirements, we wanted them all to have individual logons, therefore individual emails so that they could all individually report incidents and track the progress of them and the resolution of the mitigation um, right through the process. Um, another option was that we could have generic logins, but um, that would mean that they wouldn't have been able to track their incident they reported yesterday or last week or the week before and see who's got it, who's investigating it and what the actions are, which is the key thing because it's about getting the buy-in from them and um, the accountability and getting the right outcome to keep feeding them, so to speak. Um, we engaged a third party to help us um, go out and speak to our staff. We did some focus groups, I guess you'd call it, um, at all of the sites and spoke to mainly supervisors, team leaders, down to operators. Um, we weren't really interested too much in the 
the higher level management at the sites because they'd be on board anyway. Um, so it was about making sure that things worked for, for those people um, and the language that we used um, in the system itself. So in all the templates um, was language they'd understand. Um, so we had to keep it um, reasonably simple um, and short. Um, we had to consider things like our business works 24 seven um, in the manufacturing department. So um, around uh, reporting and um, visibility of reporting, um, if you are coming on the next shift and something's happened an hour before that might affect a machine or a worker, um, making sure that um, the reporting um, was immediate and included the right people um, and, and, and prompted them rather than having to go in lots so that they knew exactly what they're dealing with as a follow on. Um, we, um, when we, after we spoke to all of the people at our sites, we came back and um, using our implementation team, we modified the content and the language. Um, and then we set up a communication plan um, through our health and safety committees in, in meetings about um, when we were going to roll the system out and um, how it was the lead of part of our um, change in culture. Um, we we're doing a lot of other work in uh, the health and safety space in our business at the moment. And this is just one small part, but it's an important part. So we had to pitch it um, that way. We um, identified local champions at each workplace, um, as well as the health and safety committees who could assist um, staff within their team or their department to um, log on and go through the um, incident reporting or the hazard reporting and um, feel competent and successful uh, that they knew how to do it. So there was no barriers around um, being embarrassed or um, not wanting to do it. Um, we had the system set up um, in a, as a test environment or as a pilot for, um, we actually go live on next Monday, the 30th of July. So we've had it in our business for about eight weeks now, I think, um, as a pilot system. We started off in the wire wrapper, first of all, um, rolled it out there for our, um, our mill and our forestry guys, about 250 staff. And then two weeks later, we did the same in Gisborne, and then two weeks later in Kaitaia. Um, so I think it's been running for about a month in total by the time we, we go live, which has given them time to go in there and enter as many incidents as they like, um, provide us with feedback, try and break it, get competent, enjoy it, and um, have it become a BAU thing that they use. And um, other you know, small things that don't occur in other businesses that matter in our one was like we actually didn't have um, any PCs in the mills, um, in a sawmill or in a manufacturing mill they could use. So we had to set up kiosks. Um, so it was about getting those set up in the right place in the mills and having enough of them and um, so they can solely be used for this, uh, using the shed and reporting. Um, and then letting them all go through it and then making sure that they all have to turn it um, logging on with someone there to mentor them or champion them through it so that they felt good doing it. Um, and, and that's worked really well. Um, it's quite a lot of work to get those things set up in, in, in sawmills. It's not part of the normal business. Um, the other challenges are that a lot of our people um, are working on machines where um, there's not a there's no one spare standing around. So if they need to go away and report something, we have to decide how we do that. Because um, some of them would think that maybe production is number one, the machine has to keep going. So we had to get some messages sent out um, around changing our culture from the director right down. You know, safety is number one, quality is number two, and productivity is number three. So that they got it in their head that if something happens, just stop and fix it, not wait till later on, or till the end of the day, or on Monday when you, when you remember. Um, yeah, and um, we've had some really good feedback. Um, it's been it's been really cool that um, our staff have embraced it. Um, we've had some little gems come out of different people. I think there's one on the, the invite that you guys would have seen um, about a person in the wire that spoke to me after one of the sessions. But um, the key thing is that it's, it, it's, it's a great system to use um, for staff to report things straight away and they can see what's going on and it works for them and it's theirs. Cool, Chris. Um, I think, yeah, the, the most impressive thing for me um, for, from that example is that a lot of the users didn't even have an email address before we started the training. And obviously, um, for, for Duke and we set up an online health and safety management system. So you, you've got to use the computer to log things. You've got to be able to find um, Google Chrome or the Internet Explorer, some form of um, online browser. 
and um, in order obviously to, to do simple things that are very easy for, for people in offices and cities, like logging into your email, accepting an invite and logging onto a system. And that wasn't necessarily something that is particularly easy for, for the end user in, in the Jukin organization. And so apart from printing nice, nice um, posters that are very supportive and you can see them everywhere um, in the different sites, um, that, that really strengthen the health and safety culture. There was also this training element. Um, and from my perspective, I've um, been to the different sites together with Chris and um, one of my colleagues was Stacy. And um, we really could see a change in culture. The, the posters helped, the regular conversations helped, the email conversations helped um, that were, that were um, um, organized with the team leaders there. And the team leaders really included things into their um, day-to-day -day meetings that they had with their staff. So team leaders were trying to encourage people to say when they were scared of something or didn't know what something was. Really simple things like, what's a keyboard? How to use a keyboard? Are you confident turning the computer on? Um, sounds, sounds simple to a lot of people, but wasn't necessarily very simple for every Duke and end user. And I think you guys have done an amazing job in training them. So that, like just adding these additional skills that people got out of their workplace um, are actually yeah amazing things. So we'll we'll see what happens next Monday when some things are finally launched, launched and really live. But I'm very feeling very confident around it. I think the other thing um, that is a really nice example are the little beanies. Do you want to just elaborate on those, Chris? Yeah, sure. I do. Like um, when we um, we went to each site um, two weeks apart and um, did little workshops, um, 45 minutes roughly of um, a demo with um, Helena and Stacey and then we did a question and answer thing with groups of people and I think we had about 92% of um, our staff turn up at um, those over the time. As um, a lot of them, probably about 450, 500 staff did not have email um, accounts um, prior to us purchasing the system. Um, we um, we came up with a little pack as a little welcome pack to the shed, um, which included um, a message from our director um, about why we're doing it and what we're doing going forward. Um, and then there was a, a beanie, um, a merino beanie with um, a bit of branding on it and a couple of our health and safety messages, um, which was pretty cool. And inside the beanie, instead of having a price tag, there was a tag with the um, a bit of branding around the shed. And also each individual uh, had the account name um, so they could take the little price tag off the beanie go to the PC, look at their email account name and the generic login and log in for the first time. Um, and it made them feel special, um, I think, and um, personal, personal. And um, it, it was a good way to introduce it. And um, <laughs> we didn't get any negative comments either, did we? So it worked out really well. No. It was, it was quite, a good, <laughs> quite a good thing to give them all. It made them sort of feel over and above. Didn't it? Absolutely. And the office here received some as well. So we did feel really special when they landed in the post. <laughs> Um, okay, thanks, Chris. Just moving on to basically almost the last um, stage of, of an implementation and um, an important one to really affect um, or influence your health and safety culture is obviously the launch. So if you spend months or weeks setting up a good health and safety management system, you want to make sure that the launch works really well. Otherwise, your health and safety culture definitely suffers from that. And there are some key things that um, you just have to consider in terms of, um, for example, the date and time that this is clarified and this needs to be clarified with the external organization that helps you setting up your health and safety management system. But at the same time, also this date has to be clearly communicated to the very end user. They have to know that um, they might receive an email or some update on that day that from then onwards, they'll have to use the new ways of doing things, the new management system, the new software, whatever it is that you have set up. And communicating that well really is important for your health and safety culture. Otherwise, people are shocked on the day and they think, oh, I'll try it out another day. I won't do it now. Um, it's not something that I want. And they create this negative atmosphere around it. So people need to know how to use it, how to log on and what their specific responsibility is. So as a staff, I might only have to use the system to report things. Or maybe I'm also expected to check the system regularly to be aware that policies have changed, procedures have changed, and these kind of things. It is important that every end user really knows how they have to contribute to the health and safety management system and thereby to the culture. If people don't contribute to health and safety, then obviously it affects the culture in a negative way. 
So then once the system is launched, you want to really keep the momentum. So you want to make sure that you know who hasn't logged on yet, um, who has issues logging on, and you want to have processes in place to help as soon as you figure those things out. So a lot of organizations, they have team leaders in place or shift leaders or managers that can help if people experience issues using the new health and safety management system. Um, other organizations, they have buddies in place or they feel more confident talking to their colleagues instead of someone higher up the hierarchy to sort out their issues. <clears throat> and obviously there's always your, your software provider or your health and safety um, management system external party that helps you that can support you with these things as well. So sometimes they have to be, and um, you have to make changes after the system's been launched just to make things easier for people. Another really um, nice real life example comes from McFall Fields. We've had the example with the newsletter earlier, um, but they also have done a really nice change after the launch to keep people engaged. So McFall has invested in over 80 tablets which have been placed in the different trucks and um, we experienced that using paper forms can be really boring for the truck drivers to be used. So encouraging someone to find the form and then fill it in, and they can often be very lengthy and um, there might be irrelevant questions in there because it doesn't apply to that particular incident, really caused um, the problem that people weren't really keen on being part of health and safety culture. Instead of bothering finding the form, filling it in, finding the right person in the head office, where to leave it or putting it potentially on the wrong desk and then it doesn't get investigated and so on. They basically didn't want to contribute to the culture just because it was too complicated and by the time they would have figured it out, it all seemed irrelevant. So with those 80 um, tablets in the different tracks, we helped them set up a shortcut on each um, tablet um, so they could easily find the health and safety management system in there. And now reporting has actually gone up significantly for the company. And that's not because they had heaps more incidents since then, but that's because reporting is so much easier for them. Making it easy and using technology that people like is really helpful in terms of creating the momentum, keeping the momentum, momentum up and um, engaging people and thereby obviously supporting health and safety culture in a positive way. So, at the end, we just want to mention some quite important considerations, and they come from some of the examples we've already heard um, and obviously experience we've had with other clients. So there are a number of things you really want to consider, and a big example is um, relates to what Chris just mentioned from the Duke and Health and Safety Management implementation is computer literacy. So obviously um, some users, especially ones that work in offices, already know how to use a computer, they know how to switch it on, how to access software, how to access systems, but you might have end users that you expect to use a system and they find it rather hard. So as Chris said, really doing trainings with them, teaching them the new interface, teaching them the terminology and so on. So they're confident um, that they can use the system that, um, that really supports health and safety culture. And it is not just for people that haven't used a computer before, but also you might have um, switched from a different management system to something new. And often people like their routines, so having new processes, new terminology, new systems in place can be hard for them. So you need to consider that um, trainings are probably really helpful in those kind of situations. So trainings um, on, on computer usage, but also, as Chris mentioned, English can be an issue for, for people, particularly in countries like New Zealand, where you have a lot of people from different countries and different backgrounds, really um, making sure that people have someone to ask, someone that they can um, yeah, ask for help, and so that they are still encouraged to use your health and safety management system and thereby support the culture. Um, also, it means that the system needs to be set up in a very simple way. So you don't want very lengthy incident or risk reports. So if some of those details could be filled in later on by a team leader or by health and safety manager, that's a really important consideration to be made. If things are too complicated and take away their time from their actual day-to-day -day job, um, then they're not very likely to actually do those things. Again, for training, it is important to find the right concept, to find the right provider and to find the right um, tools to train people appropriately on how to use things. And that way you can obviously um, meet your goals, you can um, find out what's really happening on site and address those issues. If people report 
then often the head office or the team leaders or the managers know what's going on and they can, can find solutions to avoid these things and um, reduce risks or, or work on those. Cool. And um, lastly, I see that we have some questions that have come through already. Um, I have one for Chris here. It's a, it's a rather long one, but um, someone is asking that you um, worked with close to 700 end users who don't necessarily have much experience with health and safety or technology. So then you ask for their opinion and their feedback. And um, you probably can't implement all of those um, ideas and feedback. Don't people feel discouraged if their ideas aren't taken up? How did you, how did you deal with those scenarios? Well, that's a good question. I think um, part of it was dealt with, um, we did the development part after speaking to the focus groups um, and modified the system to make sure we hit the mark. And then when we did the, the rollout at each of the sites, um, we did workshops, um, like I said earlier on, um, we did probably eight, eight to 10 a day um, in some sites for two days. And um, so it was groups of people coming in, uh, being taken through a presentation and then given questions and answers. And we had a lot of questions come out of that too. Um, you know, some of them were, were quite negative and quite challenging, um, um, mainly around um, trust in um, ensuring accountability of the system um, because there's a bit of a, a culture in some places, I guess, where um, people have been working there for you know, a significant number of years, 15 to 20 years, um, you know, given up reporting um, hazards or incidents because um, they never got any feedback um, and how is this going to change? Um, and um, specifically in, in, in some departments or, or even specifically in some sites. And so we had to give them the assurance and show them the system how it would work, um, how um, once something's entered, was there forever um, and it was visible by the whole company right up to the board and um, people could not hide behind the mouse or um, not address things so um, that was that was difficult um, we we didn't really get any red hearing questions um, most of it was around the usability and the assurance that it would um, provide what we said it would and um, I think um, that the past four to six weeks we have been running the pilot and the feedback we've had since I think we've pretty much um, got a captive audience going forward. Um, the challenge is to make sure that we make this get better. It's just the beginning. It's just a tool for them to start using. Um, something to help them not to make the answer, make the, make the changes, but just to help us along the way. Thanks, Chris. I've got another question here. It says um, the nuts and bolts and, and paperwork are the easy bits and creating written instructions is usually self-defeating. How do you change attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors? Um, I think um, that, that's a very valid point. We all know that reading through thousands of pages of um, procedures is exhausting and people don't change just because something's written up like that. And um, what's really important from my perspective is to engage the people. So you change attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. If you find processes that are simpler, that make more sense, and if people, for example, report things and they see that things change based on that, um, that then gives them the trust um, um, to, to support the health and safety culture. So an example is that most of our clients, when we launch the system, they actually say that the reporting's increased quite significantly. And as I said before, that's not because um, you suddenly have more incidents or near misses. It is actually because things are getting easier. So making it easy for people, encouraging them to use the system really helps. And um, if, if you reach a critical mass, then even the naysayers, the people that were scared at the start, will eventually use the system. There are obviously other ways to encourage them. I mean, if, if a person in a team leader role really doesn't want to use the new health and safety management system, then you can have a serious conversation with them on what the issue is or what, what the barriers are. Maybe it's actually a technology issue. Maybe the internet's really slow at their computer. Maybe they don't understand the te technology or maybe they actually just need a training and how to do the investigation properly. And um, so I think conversations really help to take away those worries. And if you take away the worries, then you can support the health and safety culture. If you have these worried or negative people on your side, then you probably have a big champion in your organization um, <laughs> for a very long time. <clears throat> Got another question here. Um, maybe I'll give that to Chris as well. How do I change the culture of a person who does all the things required when being monitored, but doesn't believe in the system? 
Have you have you had any experiences like that so far? <laughs> He's thinking very hard. Um, almost makes me think that that hasn't been the case at um, Duke. And I think it does happen. Um, I, I think um, because it's an, I think is this an example of like um, compliance ticking the box, but the, the actual not happening in behind it, and, and it's about. It's about conversations, it's about talking to people, it's about understanding um, why they don't or, or what's the barrier, what's stopping them. Um, and, and I think the benefit in health and safety, like most of us would agree that um, you're actually doing something positive for people. It's not like you're actually demanding a KPI measurement or a, a productivity output. It's something um, that we do solely to make sure that people are safe in the workplace and get to go home at the end of the day. So um, it's about talking to them and finding out um, you know what the issue is that they're, they're finding. Um, it's got to be simple. And it's got to work for them, um, and uh, it's a challenge depending on what your business is. If people have different literacies, experience, or um, attitudes, um, and it's hard to change a culture. People have been doing things for a long time in a certain way, and, 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 and know what works and knows what don't work. So when you expect them to change, like from left handed one day to right handed the next day, um, it's a big challenge for them. So it's going to be valid reasons why, and you have to make sure that you understand what's in it for them and, and what they want. Otherwise, it won't work. Thanks, Chris. I think um, that's that's actually a very nice way to to end this webinar as well. You said at the end of the day, people want to go home safe and um, return to their families. They come to work to do a really good job. They're passionate about what they do for the organisation. Hopefully, um, but at the end of the day, the key priority is also that they get back home safely. Um, and at the end of the day, this this feeling or this passion that people then have probably supports the health and safety culture um, very well. So um, just looking at the time, I think it is um, a good moment to bring this to an end. And if there are any further questions or any feedback, obviously, we're happy to discuss. I also have our contact details on the very last slide here for you guys. And anything else that might have come up in, in your mind or comes up in the next few days or hours, um, feel free to send that through to us and um, our marketing team will also do their best to um, create a nice video out of this um, webinar so we can send that through to you and you can watch it again or share it with other people in your organization. So thanks a lot for listening and um, I wish you a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks Chris a lot for contributing. I think it was really helpful for people to hear someone's um, real life experience from a client perspective. Thanks for the invite.